Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a little worried that we've already lost uh, 10 minutes of uh, the next hour, uh, which is the first part of our session this morning. So I'm going to dispense with a couple of witticisms which I'd prepared, <laughs> except I can't resist mentioning I have no connection with the University of Reading, so I don't know why I'm described as belonging to the University of Reading here. Um, but what I should just say, it's such an impressive sight to see such a large group of uh, the eminent colleagues working on Spinoza from the French side of the Atlantic and from the American side of the Atlantic together in the same room, which doesn't happen very often, and it's a very remarkable thing. And also, of course, distinguish uh, visitors among us from the Low Countries as well. So that is enormously impressive. impressive. And uh, so, without more ado, I will ask Ed Curley to proceed with his, his paper. So, is this a good volume level for people in the back of the hall? Yes. Can you hear at the back? Yes. Okay. Closer? Okay. Some years ago, I published an interpretation of Spinoza's metaphysics, which claimed first that the relation of mode to substance in Spinoza is properly understood as one of causal dependence, not inherence or predication. Second, that Spinoza is best understood as a moderate necessitarian who would not have endorsed the strong claim often attributed to him that the actual world is the only possible world. And finally, that Spinoza is not properly understood as a pantheist. Not everyone, alas, has accepted all my conclusions. I suppose this was to be expected given the difficulty of the subject, but lately I have come to think that some of my critics have seriously misunderstood the reasoning by which I reached my conclusions, and that this was to some degree my fault for not explaining myself very well. I now think that if I had explained my argument in a way which came closer to the reasoning by which I had first arrived at my conclusions, I might at least have been better understood and perhaps more successful in persuading some dissenters. Perhaps. One can always hope, though perhaps one should not hope for too much. My starting point was not, as the order of my presentation might have suggested, a dissatisfaction with common ways of understanding the substance-mode distinction, but a worry about how to interpret Spinoza's necessitarianism. In reading Stuart Hampshire's book on Spinoza, I had found him saying that Spinoza held against Leibniz that the actual world is not one of many possible worlds, but is, in fact, the only possible world. I don't think I regarded this as such a preposterous view that no competent philosopher could have held it, so I would deny having rejected Hampshire's interpretation by appeal to the principle of charity, but I was puzzled about what it would mean to say that and what Spinoza's reasons for holding such a view might have been, if indeed he did hold it. As I was coming of age in philosophy, I had a brief flirtation with logical positivism. Graduate school quickly cured me of that, but it did leave me with a feeling that we should not take the meaning of metaphysical utterances for granted, and that when they are very puzzling, we should try to recast them in terms which might make them easier to grasp and evaluate, asking what their implications might be in concrete terms. What I had learned of Carnap's semantics seemed to suggest a natural interpretation of the anti-Leibnizian doctrine. Suppose we imagine something like a Carnapian state description, but one which gives a complete and accurate description of the world and has a temporal dimension. It will contain not only all those propositions true now, but also all those which have been true in the past and, or will be true in the future. Because the propositions describe a reality which is changing over time, if the description is to be consistent, the propositions will have to contain appropriate temporal modifiers. So the complete description of the actual world will contain such truths as, 
from January 2001 to January 2009, George W. Bush was the President of the United States. And from January 2009 to the present, Barack Obama has been President of the United States, and so on. Although the immediate inspiration for thinking of the world in this way may have been a 20th century logician, Carnap himself acknowledged a debt to Leibniz. So this move is not as anachronistic as it might seem. Given this modest apparatus, we can represent the alleged dis disagreement between Leibniz and Spinoza fairly easily. Leibniz believes in a plurality of possible worlds. This means that in addition to the description of the actual world, there are other world descriptions which differ from the description of the actual world in respect to one or more of the claims they make, and so would not be accurate descriptions of the actual world, but which are at least logically consistent, containing no contradiction. So in the actual world, the US Supreme Court settled the election of 2000, but it was siding in favor of George W. Bush. But we can apparently imagine and consistently describe a world in which they favored Al Gore and in which he became president in 2001. If it's to be consistently describable, such a possible world would no doubt differ from our world in many other ways which we can only speculate about. But it would seem that there must be many alternative worlds which are consistently describable. That, at any rate, seems to have been Leibniz's view. And in the theodicy, he seems generally to think of Spinoza as an opponent who holds that there is only one consistently describable world, and that that world is the actual world. In the passage from the Theodicy uh, just mentioned, Leibniz quotes Bale's dictionary with approval on this topic. Bale did not formulate his critique of Spinoza by deploying the concept of a possible world, but Leibniz seems to have thought Bale's reading of Spinoza was equivalent to his own. Bale had written that, and now we have a long quotation from Bale, today it is a great embarrassment for the Spinozists that according to their hypothesis, it has been as impossible from all eternity uh, that Spinoza did not die in The Hague as it would be for two and two to make six. They know very well that this is a necessary consequence of their teaching, which shocks people and puts them off because it involves an absurdity diametrically opposed to common sense. What contradiction would there have been in supposing that Spinoza died in Leiden? When I first wrote on this topic, I did not reject this strong necessitarian interpretation of Spinoza out of hand, claiming that he could not have held a view so contrary to what Bale called common sense. But I did think that before we attributed such a paradoxical view to him, we needed to try to understand how he might have defended it if pressed. This was part of my reaction against positivism. The positivists, I thought, were too quick to dismiss the metaphysicians of the past en masse as purveyors of nonsense but they were right to encourage a skeptical attitude to traditional metaphysics. The formal demonstrations of the ethics often seemed more puzzling than compelling. What was needed, I thought, was a sympathetic attempt to grasp the reasoning which must underlie those demonstrations. I thought the obvious first move to make in trying to understand Spinoza's case for denying contingency was to acknowledge his determinism. And the most illuminating formulation of that doctrine in Spinoza seemed to me to be a passage in the preface to part three of the ethics, where Spinoza writes, quote, nothing happens in nature which can be attributed to any defect in it, for nature is always the same, and its virtue and power of acting are everywhere one and the same, that is, the laws and rules of nature according to which all things happen and change from one form to another 
are always and everywhere the same. So the way of understanding the nature of anything, of whatever kind, must also be the same, namely through the universal laws and rules of nature. To make this concrete, if we want to understand some particular phenomenon, like Spinoza's death in The Hague in 1677, we must understand the laws of nature which explain it. And since the laws are universal propositions from which by themselves no particular event could follow, we must also understand the particular circumstances in which the laws were operating, what contemporary philosophers of science would call the antecedent conditions. In one way, this is helpful. It explains why some descriptions of alternative worlds, which might have seemed to be consistent, are in fact inconsistent. Consider the apparently possible world in which Spinoza died in Leiden. Where's the contradiction in that, Bale asks. And of course, the answer is that there's no contradiction in that proposition considered in itself. But embed the proposition that Spinoza died in Leiden in a rich enough context, one rich enough to contain, in addition to the laws of nature, the history of events in Spinoza's life up to the point of his death in The Hague, and there will be a contradiction. This, that rich set of propositions will entail that Spinoza died in The Hague, which will contradict any supposition that he died elsewhere. So far, so good. Introducing Spinoza's determinism into the picture enables us to see why many alternate worlds which might seem to be possible are not really possible. And so to see how Spinoza might have had some grounds for thinking that the actual world is the only possible world. But further reflection on this line of thought leads to a different conclusion. Suppose we contemplate a world whose description differs from that of the actual world only in making the supposition that instead of dying in The Hague, Spinoza died in Leiden. This world is not possible since its description also contains premises sufficient to derive the conclusion that Spinoza died in The Hague. But Spinoza, suppose we now make such changes in the description as that, of that world as we must to avoid the conclusion that Spinoza died in The Hague. In the actual world, Spinoza's death in The Hague follows logically from the laws of nature conjoined with a description of the state of the world immediately prior to his death. We make whatever changes are ne necessary in the latter description to avoid the conclusion that he died in The Hague. There will no doubt be a number of ways of doing this. Since the propositions we have just changed themselves followed from propositions in the description of the state immediately prior to that one, the description of that state will also need to be changed. And so it goes. The process we've just imagined involves an infinite regress, so it's not one we can ever think of completing ourselves, but we do know, at least, how a mind not subject to our limitations could construct a description of a world different from the actual world in its history and yet consistent. This way of thinking about Spinoza's necessitarianism suggests a way of thinking about his ontology, which seems to me quite fruitful. In trying to explain his necessitarianism, we imagined a complete description of the world, which would have to contain not only a description of the particular event of his death in The Hague in 1677, but also descriptions of the particular events or states of affairs which were the conditions of his death in that place at that time. We don't really know in any detail what those conditions were, though I think biographers generally suppose that among them was a deterioration of his lungs brought on by inhaling dust from the lenses he ground. We can use the variable letters A, B, C, etc to reflect the fact that the particular conditions which caused Spinoza's death were almost certainly quite complex, 
but are largely unknown to us. If our description of the world is to express Spinoza's form of determinism, it will have to include also the laws of nature in accordance with which that event happened. Say, anyone who is living in The Hague under conditions A, B, C, etc., will die in The Hague. How does this reflection on necessitarianism lead to any interesting ontological conclusions? Well, suppose we also hold that if a proposition is true, it must be true in virtue of some feature of the world which it correctly describes. Spinoza's discussion of truth in the metaphysical thoughts suggests that he held a view of this sort. Quote, the first meaning of true and false seems to have arisen from stories. A story was called true when it was of a deed which had really happened, and false when it was of a deed which had not happened anywhere. Afterwards, philosophers used this terminology to denote the agreement of an idea with its object and the opposite. So an idea is called true when it shows us the thing as it is in itself, and false when it shows us the thing otherwise than it really is. On this view, there will be a course, uh, uh, excuse me, sorry. For example, a true idea of Spinoza will represent him as possessing certain qualities, which he did in fact possess, and a false idea of Spinoza will represent him as possessing qualities he did not possess. On this view, there will be a correspondence between a complete and accurate description of the world and the world it describes. Following Leibniz, we think of world descriptions as sets of propositions describing how things happen in some world or other, perhaps the actual world, perhaps another, Different possible worlds are distinguished from one another by differences in the assertions their descriptions make about their worlds. Since the elements in the description of a world are propositions, the corresponding elements in that world must be thought of as entities capable of making those propositions true. The usual term for such entities is facts. So Wittgenstein put the fundamental assertion of this kind of metaphysics strikingly when he opened the Tractatus with the pronouncement that the world is everything that is the case. It is the totality of facts, not the totality of things. Now, I don't know whether I think what Wittgenstein said is true or not. He doesn't seem to explain why he said it. Perhaps it was for the kind of reason suggested in the preceding paragraph, in which case it seems to me a plausible thing to say, something I might wish on reflection to endorse. But my principal interest in this claim is the use which can be made of it in interpreting Spinoza. If there is this relation of correspondence between the complete and accurate description of the world, uh, and the world it describes, then it seems that we should be able to use the logical classification of propositions that in that description as a guide to the kinds of fact there are. We've seen that Spinoza thinks everything that happens in nature happens because the laws of nature require it. So a complete description of the world must contain in addition to particular propositions describing the properties and relations of particular things, general propositions formulating the laws of nature, saying how things behave under certain circumstances. And if the correspondence thesis is correct, a complete catalog of the facts existing in the world must contain, in addition to particular facts, general facts. Now, it seems to me that there are textual grounds for thinking that if Spinoza had expressed his ontology in these terms, he would have acknowledged the existence of general facts. The passage which seems to me to speak most directly to this question is in the treatise on the intellect, where Spinoza contrasts what he calls singular mutable things with what he calls fixed and eternal things. I imagine this passage is familiar to most of you, so I'll relegate it to a note 
and limit myself to a few comments on it. There's much that's unclear in this passage, but there are some things which seem tolerably clear and from my point of view, quite important. First of all, there are two kinds of things in the world, singular changeable things and another kind of thing also singular, but fixus, that is permanent, not changeable. The permanent things are eternal, that is they exist necessarily, the existence of the changeable things is not a necessary truth. Secondly, each of these kinds of things can be ordered into a series. In the case of the changeable things, that series is infinite. In the case of the permanent things, it is not. Third, both these series are causal, but the series of permanent things can give us knowledge of the essences of singular things whereas the series of changeable things cannot. Four, though the permanent things are singular, they are present everywhere and very powerful. Without them, the changeable things can neither be nor be conceived. So to us, they are like universals or genera of the definitions of singular changeable things and the proximate causes of all things. Finally, and most importantly from my perspective, the permanent things have inscribed in them, as in their true codices, the laws according to which all the changeable things come about. Pollock once asked what these permanent things might be, and rightly rejected the answer that they were the laws of nature. But though they are evidently not the laws of nature, the inscription metaphor certainly makes it natural to take them as those features of reality in virtue of which the laws of nature are true. So far, so good. Now we introduce one further element, the idea of a unified science, which I think Spinoza found in Descartes and adopted from him, though with crucial modifications. I owe this insight to Stuart Hampshire who wrote in his book on Spinoza, quote, if we are to provide a complete explanation of the existence and activity of anything in the universe, we must be able to deduce the existence and activity of the thing studied from the essential attributes and modes of the self-creating God or nature. This so-called pantheistic doctrine can in fact be fairly represented as the metaphysical expression of the ideal or program of a unified science. That is, of a completed science, which would enable every natural change to be shown as a completely determined effect within a single system of causes. Everything must be explicable within a single theory. That's the end of the quote from Hampshire. In Descartes, the ideal of a unified science is stated most clearly in the preface to the Principles of Philosophy where Descartes writes, this quotation from the principles, the whole of philosophy is like a tree whose roots are metaphysics, whose trunk is physics, and whose branches are all the other sciences, which reduce to three principal sciences, medicine, mechanics, and morals, end quote. Descartes' idea seems to have been that physics could be deduced from metaphysics and the rest of the sciences from physics. The deduction of physics from metaphysics depended on the immutability of God, which entailed that he could not create a world in which the quantity of motion was not preserved and in which bodies therefore necessarily obeyed certain laws of motion, such as a version of the principle of inertia and other laws governing the transfer of motion between bodies which come into contact with one another. From these laws of motion, which apply to all bodies, Descartes took himself to have adduced the laws of the more special sciences, such as the laws of reflection and refraction, which he explained in his dioptric. <clears throat> I believe that Spinoza had a similar vision of the structure of science, except, of course, that he would not put a personal, freely creating God in the beginning of the process. 
Rather, he seems to have thought that the most basic postulates of the science which would explain the phenomena of nature were those fundamental laws which express the essential nature of the attribute of extension. From these laws would follow the laws of motion and from them more specific laws. In Spinoza's Metaphysics, I suggested that we find a sketch of such a science in part two of the ethics in the physical excursus following Proposition 13, where we find an attempt to deduce principles like the law of inertia from general statements about all bodies, such as the proposition that all bodies are either in motion or at rest. The various sciences dealing with extended objects can be organized into a deductive system whose axioms would be the most general statements we can make about bodies, uh, such as the propositions that all bodies are either in motion or at rest. The various sciences dealing with extended objects can be organized into a deductive system whose axioms would be the most general statements we can make about bodies and whose theorems would be the laws of all the other sciences of extended objects with laws of motion and rest following immediately from the axioms and the less general laws being more remote deductions. Parts two and three of Spinoza's geometric exposition of Descartes' principles of philosophy would be another fragmentary attempt to work out this program. Earlier, I said that if there is this relation of correspondence between a complete and accurate description of the world and the world it describes, then we should be able to use the logical classification of the propositions in that description as a guide to the kinds of fact there are. Now I want to suggest that if the relation of correspondence holds, we can use the logical relations between propositions in a complete description of the world as a guide to the causal relations between the facts in virtue of which they are true. When Spinoza writes that infinitely many things in infinitely many modes follow from the necessity of the divine nature, I take that as a reflection of the fact that every non-basic proposition in the complete description of the world follows from the most basic propositions in that description, the axioms of the unified science, which express the nature of the divine attribute of extension. The general fact corresponding to those axioms constitute the nature of God insofar as he is conceived under the attribute of extension. The axioms are the most general propositions there are or can be involving the concept of extension. So the facts they describe in virtue of their nature as foundational can have no more fundamental cause they must exist in themselves and be conceived through themselves. This offers a way of understanding the doctrine that God is causa sui. One of the most attractive features of this interpretation, it seems to me, is that it helps us to understand why Spinoza should have thought that there are such things as infinite modes and what, they're made, what they might be. There is apparently no precedent for such entities in Cartesian thought prior to Spinoza. But the unified science I am supposing will contain as immediate consequences of the axioms, truths which are less general than the axioms. The first such consequence, as is to be expected in the corpuscularian science of Spinoza's day, will be the laws of motion and rest. In the presence of the correspondence principle, the truth of these theorems will have ontological consequences. There will be general facts in virtue of which the laws of motion and rest are true. So when Spinoza is pressed to name an inf immediate infinite mode of extension, he calls it motion and rest. If we think that the laws of motion and rest hold for the whole of space and time without restriction, then it will not be surprising that the fixed and eternal things in virtue of which they are true should be described as being present everywhere. 
It might be objected that this interpretation will not work for the immediate infinite mode of the attribute of extension, which Spinoza designates as the face of the whole universe. Referring to the scholium to lemma seven in part two of the ethics. I believe Spinoza scholars have generally taken this reference to entail that the whole of nature understood as the totality of all bodies is immediate infinite mode under the attribute of extension. But I think that must be a mistake and that these scholars need to reconsider their reading of letter 64. I do not see how the totality of bodies could follow from the absolute nature of God unless the individual bodies which make up that totality also followed from the absolute nature of God. One of the most important consequences of my interpretation, I think, is that it entails that particular finite things do not follow from the absolute nature of God. I stress the adjective absolute here. It would be unfortunate for Spinoza's system if they did. Particular finite things are temporal. They come into being and pass away. But the nature of God, the attributes which express his nature, is not temporal, but eternal. What follows logically from something which is eternal must itself be eternal. So if particular finite things did follow from the absolute nature of God, they would be eternal, not temporal. The only way to rescue Spinoza from absurdity would be to maintain that the world of the finite and changing is an illusion, that really everything is eternal. Some interpreters have apparently thought this was correct, but I think they were wrong. The problem is that we have not paid sufficient attention to the wording of Proposition 21 in Part 1 of the Ethics. Everything which follows from the absolute nature of any of God's attributes has had to exist always and as infinite. That is, by the same attribute, they are eternal and infinite. Unless, it, unless we are subject to a massive delusion, it cannot be true of particular finite things that they exist always and as infinite. So they do not follow from the absolute nature of any divine attribute. They follow from the nature of God only if statements about that nature are conjoined with statements about other finite things. This is reflected in the model metaphysics I have been using to interpret Spinoza. If we are going to explain the existence and activities of a particular finite thing, we need to invoke not only the laws of nature, but also truths about the particular conditions under which those laws were operating. Um, and now I finish the paper abruptly with the comment, there's a lot more to say about this, but I think I may have exceeded the limit of what I can say in 30 minutes. I suspect the timekeeper would tell me I have. Am I? Excellent. Okay. I'll stop now. So now we move on to the uh, uh, Pierre-François Moreau's uh, response to every turn. Avant de commenter la forte communication des Louis Curley, je voudrais formuler trois remarques d'abord. La première, ça va toujours par trois. Hein. La première, Edwin Curley a été jadis, naguère, le premier ou l'un des premiers spinozistes américains qui ait discuté avec les spinozistes européens et notamment français. Il y avait eu, après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, une très longue période où les spécialistes de Spinoza des différents pays ne se connaissaient guère et je ne suis même pas sûr qu'il se lisait. Depuis la guerre qui avait vu la disparition de la Societa Spinozana, la recherche se poursuivait dans chaque pays, en quelque sorte en vase clos. Or, il y a près de 40 ans, en 1977, les colloques du tricentenaire ont enfin donné aux uns et aux autres l'occasion de se rencontrer, c'est-à-dire de se voir, de se lire et même de discuter. C'est alors que les Français ont découvert en Italie Emilia Giancotti, 
en Allemagne, Manfred Walter et Wolfgang Bartuscha, aux Pays-Bas, Hübeling et Rido van Sortelen, et aux États-Unis, Edwin Curley. Depuis lors, les colloques, les invitations, les revues ont permis que ce lien reste toujours vivant, et pour les spinozistes des générations suivantes, il est devenu tout naturel de développer leurs recherches dans un horizon international. Mais il faut rappeler que ce n'avait pas toujours été ainsi et que Edwin a contribué à briser cet isolement par ses voyages en Europe, par sa participation à beaucoup de discussions internationales et par l'organisation du mémorable colloque de Chicago en 1986, qu'il en soit publiquement remercié. Deuxième remarque, puisque je parle de temps ancien, revenons à l'année 1969. C'est la date de publication du livre d'Edwin Curley, « La métaphysique de Spinoza ». Je trouve remarquable que le texte qu'il nous présente aujourd'hui soit la reprise d'une analyse qu'il avait amorcée dans cet ouvrage et qu'elle se marque par l'effort pour formuler de manière plus convaincante les thèses qui, alors, avaient pu le soulever des objections. Il va même jusqu'à supposer que si certains n'avaient pas compris son livre, c'est qu'il s'était mal exprimé. Moi, je ne suppose jamais ça. Euh il me semble qu'on le peut voir dans un tel retour sur une discussion d'il y a presque 50 ans et dans la patiente recomposition de ses arguments, quelque chose qui n'est pas si courant dans l'historiographie de la philosophie. Je veux dire le sérieux du travail de la pensée. Si ce qui a été dit a un sens, si ce sens n'a pas été compris, alors il vaut la peine d'en reprendre la thématique, d'en redéfinir les termes, d'en sous-peser les distinctions pour savoir si finalement, une interprétation peut être soutenue ou non, pour savoir si elle nous permet d'avancer avec rigueur dans la compréhension de la pensée de Spinoza et de ce qu'elle nous apprend sur son rapport au monde, le monde de Spinoza, ou, après tout, le nôtre. Il n'y a pas de raison que Spinoza ne nous aide pas à comprendre la loi travail, le socialisme, les grèves, l'écologie, etc., etc., c'est la patience du concept, en somme, qui est en jeu dans une telle insistance. Troisième remarque, plusieurs fois dans ce texte, Edwin Curley mentionne son rapport au positivisme logique et à d'autres doctrines du XXe siècle. Il rappelle qu'il tentait alors de faire le partage entre ce qu'il refusait chez le positiviste, en gros, le rejet des philosophies du passé comme simplement absurde, et ce qu'il acceptait chez ces positivistes, à savoir l'attitude sceptique à l'égard de la métaphysique traditionnelle, c'est-à-dire, au fond, la nécessité d'en élucider les enjeux et les modes de démonstration. Il indique ce que son antipositivisme devait aux thèses de John Passmore, l'idée que pour comprendre les débats contemporains, il faut saisir le procès dialectique qui en a produit les termes mêmes. Autrement dit, il souligne ici un point nodal de l'épistémologie de l'histoire des idées, ce que l'on écrit sur une controverse passée est aussi déterminé par les controverses présentes. Il me semble que c'est là une position extrêmement féconde pour saisir la signification des débats en histoire de la philosophie. L'attention aux conditions d'énonciation actuelles des travaux historiographiques. Si le passé est comme l'insu de notre présent, il faut voir aussi que c'est le présent qui choisit les questions que nous posons au passé. Après ces remarques, j'en viens à la discussion proprement dite. Je vais m'attarder seulement sur deux points. Premièrement, je voudrais d'abord m'arrêter sur la question du nécessitarisme et des mondes possibles. Je propose de reprendre le passage de Pierre Bell que cite Leibniz. Il s'agit d'une remarque sur la cohérence, ou plutôt sur l'incohérence, de la philosophie stoïcienne. Bell rappelle que Chrysippe n'a pas accepté la position nécessitariste de Diodor Cronos, l'argument dominateur, et qu'il a, selon Bell toujours, qu'il a eu tort, puisqu'en fait, cette position, le nécessitarisme, est cohérente avec la conception stoïcienne du destin. Cette incohérence pour Bell s'explique par un recul devant les conséquences morales odieuses et affreuses de cette doctrine, Soit dit en passant, on reconnaît là au passage euh, la tendance de Bell à réécrire les philosophies euh, selon les simplifications qu'il y effectue au nom du bon sens 
et non pas selon leur architecture propre. En gros, Bell a tendance à expliquer aux auteurs ce qu'ils ont vraiment voulu dire et qu'ils n'ont pas réussi à dire, et que lui a mieux compris. Et aussitôt, il étend la discussion au spinozisme, et là, l'embarras qu'il attribue aux disciples remplace l'incohérence supposée du maître. Alors, je cite la citation dans le texte de Bell, en français, et j'ajoute la première phrase. « Je crois que les stoïciens s'engagèrent à donner plus d'étendue aux choses possibles qu'aux choses futures, afin d'adoucir les conséquences odieuses et affreuses que l'on tirait de leur dogme de la fatalité. » C'est un grand embarras pour les spinozistes que de voir que, selon leur hypothèse, il a été aussi impossible de toute éternité que Spinoza, par exemple, ne mourut pas à la haie, qu'il est, impossi qu est impossible que deux et deux fassent six. Ils sentent bien que c'est une conséquence nécessaire de leur doctrine et une conséquence qui rebute, qui est farouche, qui soulève les esprits par l'absurdité qu'elle renferme, diamétralement opposée au sens commun. Ils ne sont pas bien aises que l'on sache qu'ils renversent une doctrine aussi universelle, aussi évidente que celle-ci. Tout, tout, tout ce qui implique contradiction est impossible et tout ce qui n'implique pas contradiction est possible. Or, quelle contradiction y aurait-il en ce que Spinoza serait mort à l'aide La nature aurait-elle été moins parfaite, moins sage, moins puissante On peut remarquer immédiatement que Bale, ici, confond contradiction logique et impossibilité de fait. En réalité, rien dans la doctrine spinoziste n'assimile l'une et l'autre, et cette confusion rend évidemment l'argument de Bale totalement inefficace. Mais je ne suis pas le premier à le remarquer. Leibniz lui-même le souligne, juste après les lignes où il cite le passage. Et donc Leibniz ne reprend pas complètement l'argumentation de Bale, contrairement à ce qu'on pourrait croire en lisant seulement le début. Il dit, opposons-lui donc, donc opposons à Spinoza, ces paroles de M. Bell qui sont assez à mon gré. Mais tout est dans le « assez ». Et on va voir dans la suite que « assez » veut dire finalement pas beaucoup. Opposons-lui donc ces paroles de M. Bell qui sont assez à mon gré. Et il poursuit. On peut dire de M. Bell, « Ubi bene nemo melius », là où il est bon, personne n'est meilleur, Quoi qu'on ne puisse pas dire de lui ce qu'on disait d'origine, ou bimalé, nemo peius. Là où il est mauvais, personne n'est pire. Euh, on va voir ensuite que finalement. Cependant, M. Bell gâte un peu. Alors là, le un peu répond au assez de la phrase précédente et contribue à étendre la crevasse. M. Bell gâte un peu ce qu'il a dit avec tant de raison. Or, quelle contradiction y aurait-il à ce que Spinoza fût mort à l'aide La nature aurait-elle été moins parfaite, moins sage, moins puissante Il confond ici ce qui est impossible parce qu'il implique contradiction avec ce qui ne saurait arriver parce qu'il n'est pas propre à être choisi. Il est vrai qu'il n'y aurait point eu de contradiction dans la supposition que Spinoza fût mort à l'aide et non pas à la haie. Il n'y avait rien de si possible la chose était donc indifférente par rapport à la puissance de Dieu. Mais il ne faut pas s'imaginer qu'aucun événement, quelque petit qu'il soit, puisse être conçu comme indifférent par rapport à sa sagesse et à sa bonté. Fin de citation. On n'est donc pas dans un jeu à deux positions, Spinoza le nécessitariste d'un côté et de l'autre côté Bell et Leibniz qui seraient partisans du possible. En fait, c'est un jeu à trois positions. Spinoza, pour qu'il n'y a pas ontologiquement de possible. Bell, pour qui tous les non-contradictoires, c'est-à-dire les possibles, ont un même droit à l'existence. Et Leibniz, pour qui ces non-contradictoires sont certes équivalents du point de vue de la puissance, mais non pas du point de vue de la sagesse. Autrement dit, ils n'ont pas tous le même droit à l'existence. C'est la question du choix. Autrement dit, il y a bien des mondes possibles, mais aussi un choix entre ces mondes possibles. Ce qui fait que, du point de vue du meilleur, c'est-à-dire de la sagesse, il ne pourrait y avoir d'autre monde que celui-là. Ce qui revient, pour le dire crûment, à réintroduire dans un langage finaliste ce que Spinoza énonçait en se passant de finalité. C'est le tour de passe-passe à l'émission. Il resterait à se demander pourquoi ce détour. Je fais l'hypothèse suivante. Spinoza et Leibniz raisonnent dans un monde 
le monde de Copernic, de Kepler, de Galilée et de Descartes, un monde que la physique est en train d'unifier et où elle montre au moins potentiellement que tous les phénomènes s'expliquent par la nécessité des lois mécaniques. Dès lors, il y a deux solutions, ou bien d'une façon qu'on peut dire matérialiste. On accepte la nécessité à l'intérieur du monde, ce que font Hobbes et Spinoza. Ou bien, pour préserver un choix divin, on extrait la nécessité du monde pour la placer, sans le dire explicitement, entre les mondes au moment du choix, et c'est ce que fait l'hypothèse du meilleur des mondes possibles. Ce que Spinoza, s'il l'avait connu, aurait considéré comme l'escroquerie lemnitienne, à juste titre. Reste à remarquer aussi que Spinoza ne parle jamais des mondes possibles, même pour en nier l'existence. Ce lexique, c'est celui de Leibniz et non pas celui de Spinoza. Pourquoi Considérer que les possibles forment un monde ou des mondes, c'est considérer qu'on peut donner assez de cohérence en dehors de toute expérience à des lois causales qui flotteraient en dehors de toute effectivité. C'est donc spéculer sur l'ignorance où nous sommes de la chaîne complexe des événements réels pour imaginer dans chacune de ces fictions un monde prêt à passer à l'existence dès lors que la sagesse divine le désignera comme le meilleur. Autrement dit, dès que l'on parle de monde possible, on se place sur le terrain de Leibniz et l'on est logiquement conduit à penser qu'il y en a plusieurs puisqu'on a fait imaginairement table rase de ce qui se pourrait s'opposer à leur existence. On comprend ainsi pourquoi Spinoza s'autorise, on comprend aussi ainsi pourquoi Spinoza s'autorise, après l'avoir refusé ontologiquement, à ressusciter le possible dans le domaine de l'action. Précisément parce que dans le domaine de l'action, on est là dans le registre de l'ignorance, dans le monde éthique interhumain, où les lois sont non moins nécessaires, mais où nous devons prendre des décisions en ignorant les complexes interactions entre les effets de ces lois, nous avons besoin de la notion de possible, et c'est pourquoi elle est utilisée, sans que ce soit contradictoire, dans la quatrième partie de l'éthique. Je passe maintenant à la deuxième question que je voulais traiter, celle du panthéisme, et de la question de la puissance absolue de Dieu. Le terme de panthéisme, comme on sait, vient de Tolande et non pas de Spinoza lui-même, et il a une riche histoire ultérieure, soit dans l'idéalisme allemand, soit en France, dans les polémiques autour de Victor Cousin et de son école, qui ont rythmé la vie intellectuelle d'une grande partie du XIXe siècle. Mais au-delà du terme, la discussion renvoie une querelle qui consiste à lire dans un certain nombre de doctrines, dont le spinozisme, la dissolution de monde en Dieu. Ces doctrines accorderaient tellement de place à la puissance divine et tellement peu aux créatures en dehors de leur rapport à Dieu que celles-ci n'auraient finalement presque plus de réalité propre et que leur existence se ramènerait au fond à une illusion. C'est une critique qu'on a fait constamment à Spinoza de la part de gens qui l'avaient un peu trop vite lu. Edwin Curley montre bien que cette doctrine n'est évidemment pas celle de Spinoza et j'ajouterai pour ma part, au contraire, Spinoza est un penseur de la finitude positive. L'infini chez lui est surtout un moyen de penser celle-ci, la finitude, le plus positivement possible. Mais néanmoins, certaines interprétations de cette doctrine risquent de conduire, cette interprétation du spinozisme risque de conduire à cette lecture. Et effectivement, le point essentiel, c'est ici la question de savoir ce qui vient de la puissance absolue de Dieu. En ce qui concerne certaines choses et événements finis, cette puissance absolue ne s'exerce que par l'intermédiaire du contexte multiple des interactions entre les singularités, et ce sont même ces interactions qui assurent à chaque chose individuelle son poids ontologique, sa perfection. C'est la capacité à affecter et à être affectée qui distingue entre elles les choses finies et particulières, et le fait que le corps humain, par sa complexité, possède cette double capacité à un très haut point, lui confère sa spécificité, à quoi correspond la spécificité de la mens humana. Il resterait à se demander si Spinoza a toujours été au même point d'élucidation de la spécificité de sa doctrine sur ce point-là. On peut estimer, avec Alexandre Matheron, que sa pensée est devenue de plus en plus spinoziste. Depuis la Corte of Handling, qui est le texte peut-être le moins difficile à tirer vers le panthéisme, Jusqu'à l'ultime exposition du système, celle qu'on trouve dans les premiers chapitres du Tractatus Politicus, où elle apparaît véritablement comme l'ontologie de la puissance et de la puissance des choses finies. Il y aurait encore beaucoup à dire, je n'ai pas le temps, 
Merci en tout cas à Edwin Curley de nous avoir fait réfléchir à ces questions essentielles. Thank you, Edwin, for your, your paper. Um, you mentioned the distinction in, uh, on treaties and on intellect, distinction between uh, changing things and uh, fixed and uh, eternal things. Uh, the expression fixed and eternal things disappears in ethics. Do you think that Spinoza changes, changes his mind? and uh, introduce a new conception uh, because uh, infinite modes uh, doesn't uh, appear in, in treatises on intellect. Uh, do you think there is a change in his thought or uh, how do you explain the, the, the fact that there is no more the expression fixed and eternal things in ethics? Uh, yeah, uh, my view would be that the, uh, the, the terminology changes, uh, but that the basic doctrine doesn't change. Um, Very good. Another question. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but... Um, uh, thank you, Ed and, and Pierre Francois, for those um, comments. Um, uh, you said that Ed, that you were rethinking uh, that you were thinking that perhaps your presentation in the, your initial book was perhaps not as clear as it could be. And I thought that this is very helpful. Um, your presentation today, but we didn't have time, I think, to talk about one of the most controversial aspects of your interpretation, namely that um, uh, finite things are are modes or pro properties or states of God. And uh, this is gestured at a little bit discussing in the pantheism part of the paper and the responses today. But could you say a little bit about how your focus on necessitarianism as the launching point for your interpretation would lead to your, your view about modes not being properties or states? Because one could think that even with this kind of logical positivism, this kind of emphasis on necessitarianism and facts and laws, etc., that could all be articulated within the context of a view according to which finite things are mere modes or states of God. So how exactly is that most controversial aspect of your interpretation, does, that get shed, does light get shut on that aspect of your interpretation by this new uh, way of presenting things as starting from the necessitarianism? Okay. Um. Okay, I want to grab this opportunity to uh, say something I would have said in the paper itself if, if I hadn't felt constrained by time. Um, and it bears a little bit on, on something that uh, Pierre-Francois said in his comments. Um, my book came out in 1969. In 1968, there was a major French work the first volume of Guru's commentary on the ethics. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, he and I agreed on, actually, of the three theses that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk as being th principal conclusions of, of my book, uh, two of them were things that I found also in Guru. Uh, they were uh, arrived at independently. I mean, although my book appeared a year later than his, 
the basic ideas uh, go back to 62, 63, uh, when I was writing my thesis. So uh, with respect to uh, the, the claim that uh, the relation of mode to substance is one of causal dependence and not one of in predication or inherence, I mean, that's in Guru, uh, but arrived at by a different line of argument. Uh, w now, I don't want to just simply appeal to the authority of Guru, uh, although that is in some ways a tempting thing to do. But, uh, the, uh, but what I would say is that people who want to uh, reject my interpretation uh, need to consider uh, the, the that there's another line of reasoning by which you can get to the same conclusion. Uh, and the, the other thesis that uh, I identified as one of my principal uh, claims was the uh, rejection of pantheism in Spinoza. And, uh, you know, okay, it's not enough just to reject my reasoning such as it is. Uh, people who want to reject that ought to re reject also the, uh, the line of reasoning you find in uh, Guru. Uh, how do, uh, uh, now I think to come to, more directly to your question, um, I mean, uh, I don't mind saying that uh, the, uh, uh, the finite things are modes of God. I mean, we have to say that. The question is what we understand by it. And uh, what I understand by it is that uh, the finite things are causally dependent on God in this rather complex way that uh, my theory requires. That is to say, um, the, I, I see this twofold uh, method of causation. On the one hand, there is deduction from the most fundamental facts uh, of the universe through the uh, more particular, uh, that is to say, less general uh, facts. And, and that's, a fa that's a finite series of causes. And then uh, at the finite level, and the, the, two, the two kinds of cause are, uh, as I put it, separately necessary and only jointly sufficient. So in order to get a particular finite thing out of the infinite causes, you need the infinite series of finite causes as well. Um, so, um, as long as you under, as long as you get the causality right, I don't care how you describe it. Uh, although I would say also that uh, one reason why I think predication is not very important in Spinoza is that uh, predication is already built into the nature of the of the ultimate realities. That is. The, the facts themselves that I take to be the the features of the world, which I mean, that's my name for the features of the world in virtue of which these propositions are true. Uh, it's got predication built into it, uh, and it would be superfluous to uh, to introduce it again at the relationship between substance and its modes. I, I know there are lots more questions, but I think I ought to. Uh Apologize to those to put their hands up who, who put their hands up because time really is pressing and if we're going to have a 10 minute break or uh, around 10 minutes I think we must stop there so as not to get too behind in our program so shall we say 10 minutes and then we resume at 10 two.